So thanks, Dan. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm really impressed by the attendance. You guys have uh, been here and engaged, and um, I'm very appreciative uh, of you attending today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about opioids, and probably opioids in a way that you haven't classically heard of. But some of you have heard this lecture before, and we'll see some repeat data, but we actually ha do have new data all the time. Um, I'll be talking about opioids as it relates to acute care prescribing, specifically surgery, dentistry, and emergency medicine. But I think no matter what role you play in the healthcare system, this should resonate, or just in your own personal experiences. Um, we have funding from um, NIDA as well as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So this really is a partnership between MDHHS and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and the University of Michigan. Um, I, have, I do consult for Heron Therapeutics, but I won't be discussing any of their products today. So everybody's aware of the opioid epidemic. I started giving this lecture about three or four years ago, and, and I would say 78 deaths per day, and then 91, and then 115 deaths per day, and now more than 130 deaths per day. And, and just that number always seemed to be enough. Just simply saying 78 deaths per day a few years ago, I, I thought that was enough. I could make the analogy of planes falling out of the sky, but then as I've traveled more and spoken more, I probably give one to two opioid-related lectures a week. I've started to hear more stories, and I'll be blunt. Uh, these stories stick with me in a very deep and personal way, and they drive me. And I'll tell you one story, and some of you have heard the story because I've actually had the pleasure, or I don't know if I really call it the pleasure, but I've been, I've been very fortunate to have a colleague and a friend present with me. And he tells the story of his son. Grew up in a loving house, parents who loved him, brother who loved him, handsome young man, very, very good hockey player and had a musculoskeletal hockey injury. Didn't have surgery, but very well could have had surgery. And was given opioids for that musculoskeletal injury. And his brother now tells years later that he knew in that moment he liked opioids. He really liked oxycodone. And after he'd gone through his own supply, he started buying that supply from their house cleaner, who was taking opioids from other people's homes and redistributing them. And his brother knew this, but was sworn to secrecy. His father thought this was a teenage son who was just being a jerk, or there's other words that he could use, right? Didn't realize that this was a sign of something deeper, and his son eventually moved to heroin. And as he moved down this path of heroin, in and out of recovery, father, who was thankfully deeply resourced, was able to spend more than six figures in his son's recovery, in and out of recovery facilities, when we spoke last and when we got to present together, most recently he has a friend read the last text from his son. Because every communication they had finished with, I love you and I'm proud of you, in both directions. That love being expressed in both directions and instead, it's happened again. I've relapsed again. I'm so sorry, I need to get this out of my system. I love you so much, thank you for all that you've done for me. And now his dad is committed to change, but we look at that situation and we go back to the very beginning. Did that initial prescription even need to happen? We've heard, so year over year, and these data are actually now a year dated. This was very new data last year, but year over year decreases in prescribing since that peak of prescribing around 2010 where hydrocodone was the most common prescription in the United States. Not most common opioid, actually the most commonly prescribed medication in the United States in 2010. And every state is showing changes. We have every state decreasing the number of prescriptions given, the number of people meeting that above 90 oral morphine equivalent threshold, maybe the only controversial point of the CDC guidelines, but yet a point I don't find controversial. I don't, ha I don't have any patients in my clinic on more than 90 oral morphine equivalents who are doing well. We could talk about that later. And, and less new starts. And so this is all positive, but then some of the advocates in the group, and Dan has probably experienced more of this through the HHS task force, will show this. They'll say, you know, despite the fact that we're decreasing prescribing year over year, mortality is increasing. And the spike and the discrepancy is actually even greater now because we had heroin and fentanyl. And not fentanyl from the operating rooms, but the Walter Whites of the world knowing how to make fentanyl in their own kitchen, taking a few hundred dollars worth of product from China, and turning into hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of street fentanyl. And so this is driving prescribing. But, and so people will take this snapshot and say, this is proof that decreasing prescribing won't change mortality. And I'll agree and disagree. Prescribe, changes in prescribing alone won't change mortality today. But we have to look at the full picture. Dan talked about it in the mid-90s. 
Purdue Pharma, the release of OxyContin, and now the marketing of opioids. And not long after, there was a, a, there was a decrease, uh, there was a, an associated, strongly associated increase in mortality. At its root, fundamentally, the opioid epidemic is a prescribing problem. We've created a supply and supply demand issue with heroin and with fentanyl. And ultimately, while this can't be their only strategy, we have to address prescribing. Now, our group's a little different. When we came together about three or four years ago, we just said, you know, the whole group is, it, the whole country is focused on all of these downstream effects. What to do with chronic pain, what to do with medication-assisted treatment, how to better manage the people already using opioids. And let me tell you, these are important topics, and we'll actually hear about some of these other topics today. We've got some great speakers today talking about all these downstream effects. But at that time, really no one was talking about this. Should we only focus on opioid users and those patients that already have opioid addiction, or should we also focus on the people not using opioids, especially in the cases of predictable opioid exposure? And what do I mean by that? If we walk over to the University of Michigan Hospital right now, and I go into the preoperative setting, and I say, what's going to predict whether and how much opioid a person's going to get? There's only two factors. What surgery they're having and the surgeon caring for them. And the same thing's going to be true for dentistry and oral surgery. The case you're having and the person prescribing for you are the only factors that matter. You as an individual are, aren't accounted for in any way, shape, or form. Right? That's not personalized medicine, and this is clearly part of our problem. Not only that, we know that the prescribing after surgery, dentistry, and emergency medicine is more important than it once was. So these data are from national prescribing data from a private claims data set. So these are privately insured patients. It's over a seven-year period. And at the top, you've got surgery, dentistry, emergency medicine. And the bottom there is probably all others, which is predominantly primary care, internal medicine and primary care. Over that time period, which is actually in the preamble to the CDC guidelines, so this is before the CDC guidelines were released, you see that the relative contribution of who's giving the first prescription to people not using opioids, that surgery and dentistry by, by comparison are increasing because primary care physicians are prescribing less often, right? So CDC guidelines didn't just come out of the blue. People were talking about it, sort of saying, hey, you know, there's something something going on here and we need to be a little bit more care careful with our prescribing. My sense is that this discrepancy will only be greater when we look at it next. Moreover, if you look at how much opioid people are prescribing, this oral morphine equivalence, surgeons had a big uptick when hydrocodone got rescheduled. So hydrocodone got rescheduled, we can no longer phone it in. What do surgeons do? They start giving more in case I miss, right? I gotta give you more now because I can't phone it in. The net effect of that policy was very clear. Hydrocodone prescribing in the US decreased because primary care physicians couldn't easily call it in. However, surgeons, and we're looking at it now, probably dentists started increasing their prescribing. And really, even if you look over the last couple years, this, this last two or three years of this data set, there at the bottom in the yellow, you see not only are primary care physicians prescribing less often, they're also prescribing less opioid per prescription, while surgeons and dentists weren't showing any change. So why? We could put, we could put just about any head in this picture and say, what drives prescribing? These are, qualitative, these are from qualitative data from surgeons, but we've seen this as well from dentists. And my sense is that even me as a pain physician, some of these same factors hold true. We worry about time. We worry about satisfaction. We worry about the calls for refill or that, that request for refill. And sometimes we've actually put perverse incentives. We, we've linked satisfaction and payment. And even as the HCAP measure has been removed from reimbursement, I think providers clearly still care because they want Mrs. Jones to go back to the doctor and say, Brum, it's a good guy. You should send him more patients to get that referral. This is still important. Well, good news. These are two papers, but we've published about six or seven cents, and there's been many other groups that have shown the same thing. There is absolutely no association between the number of pills prescribed after surgery and people's satisfaction with their care, nor is there an association between the number of pills prescribed and the likelihood for refill. Okay? So we live in a town where, where Zingerman's is just like, right, where is it? It's like right there, right? Right? Ever, how many of you have been to Zingerman's? Everybody been to Zingerman's, right? So you walk in, it's kind of a different experience. You, you, you know, it's not just because the sandwiches are really expensive. <laughs> they, they, they're, there's just a different vibe about the place, right? And they treat you differently. Well, I'll give the satisfaction example to say that our pain clinic, 
after um, you know Afton and I and, and the rest of the team, we we brought Zing Train in to start to revamp the way we function and our culture and our mission and our vision for our team. That spilled over to our pain clinic, tertiary care pain facility. We tend to see refractory patients. Our patient satisfaction engagement surveys have been in uh, 99.7, 98.8, and 98.7 over the last three quarters after years of sort of steady climb since engaging them because now we treat our patients like customers. Right? We're not perfect. We're not, we don't do everything right. I'm sure that for some of those that have tried to refer to us, you found it frustrating at times, but once you get them in the door, our patients are really well cared for. We didn't do this by prescribing more opioids. We did this by caring for people like customers in a restaurant. Now, you could flip it around and say, well, what about refills? Don't they happen? Of course they happen. They happen all the time. In fact, if you look at the abdominal surgery condition, they happen about 7% of the time. If you take a total knee replacement, about 30% of the patients are gonna refill. But whether you look at that abdominal surgery and you look at the equivalent of less than six pills of hydrocodone or more than 60, the rate doesn't change. There's no association. You give them six pills, they'll call for 7% of the time. You give them more than 60 pills, they'll call 7% of the time. And there won't be any differences in pain satisfaction. Well, I was really interested in this concept, however. How often does the person not using opioids in the year prior become what I would call a new persistent user or a new chronic opioid user. And this is probably the article for which we got the biggest splash. 6% of patients under a case mix of both major and minor surgeries who hadn't filled an opioid in the year prior kept filling past long, long past what we'd be deemed normal surgical recovery after we have excluded everything we could exclude in this data set. And there was no difference between major surgery and minor surgery. Now some of my colleagues were really, really surprised by that. Like wouldn't major surgery be more likely because this is clearly post-surgical pain, right? Well, Jenna Gessling, who will be speaking tomorrow um, as some of her preliminary data for her, her NIH grant, um, looked at some of our prospectively collected data after knee and hip replacement. So this is from the first grant that Dan and I had together. We looked at those patients not using opioids prior to knee and hip replacement, and looked six months later, and 4% of the hips and 8% of the knees kept using. And these are prospectively collected data. We actually confirm with the patient, not using before, definitely continue to use after. And we had the gold standard measures of pain, stiffness, and function after knee and hip replacement. And there's no association between whether the knee got better, worse, or stayed the same in people using opioids. This is not just chronic post-surgical pain. It's the individual that matters more so than the surgery. 13% of hand surgery, 13% of spine surgery. This is the only one up there not from our group. 4.8% of teens and adolescents undergoing elective pediatric surgery. 10% of curative cancer surgery, and probably our most complicated cohort, um, breast surgery patients, 19% of the women undergoing breast surgery, which is associated with chemo and radiation and subsequent surgery. But for those survivors, about 20% of people, at least for some prolonged period of time, becoming a chronic opioid user. In other words, a new source of morbidity. And I think our cancer exception, while, I'm, while I am in favor of, can of opioids being available for malignant terminal pain, our cancer exception is in some ways maybe a problem of itself. Because if you compare that 10% to the 6% on top, those surgical, the surgical insult was effectively the same. Similar incisions, similar things. And this is curative cancer surgery where we expect to cut the cancer out. That cancer exception of I'm a patient, I have cancer, maybe I'm more willing to use the opioid. And I'm treating a patient with cancer, maybe I'm more willing to give the opioid. We've got to be a little careful with how we use that in non-malignant pain preface. So what are the factors that we think are driving this? Well, these are the things that I think really come up consistently from data set to data set. Preoperative chronic pain conditions. Maybe the primary care physicians are doing a better job of not giving you opioids for that preoperative knee pain. Or I'm sorry, for your chronic knee pain or your chronic low back pain. You come in, you have abdominal surgery, you get an opioid and all of a sudden you keep taking it, but you don't really know that, you, you don't really tell your doctor it's for your knee or hip, which might initially be better, but over the long term, their data really don't support the use of that opioid for that chronic pain condition. Certainly we see anxiety and mood disorders, and anxiety in particular, that for some patients, especially those with anxiety, it's not that opioids make them feel high, but they feel leveled. So when you talk to patients, some with opioid use disorder, especially those who had anxiety as a kid, they'll say, hey, the first time I experienced opioid, I thought I finally felt normal. I thought I finally felt like all the other people I knew. 
I felt, I felt like I was in a good space. And then eventually, however, that can further deteriorate mood and then you start to avoid withdrawal. And then although the path is not linear, some patients fully moving down the road of opioid use disorder. Substance use history seems obvious. Of course, if they have a substance use history, they'll be more likely to use opioids chronically. But the reality is we don't do a good job of screening for that or planning for that for surgery and then tobacco use probably as a surrogate. And this is not just for surgery. I'm sure most of you have had your wisdom teeth removed, something we do three and a half million times a year in the US. After adjusting for everything we could adjust for in this data set, including patient demographics, pain diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses, uh, medical comorbidities, and the impaction status of the tooth. I actually had to learn the numbers of the teeth. Uh, it's number 1, 16, 17, and 32. Those are your wisdom teeth. After adjusting for all those factors, just being prescribed an opioid was associated with a 2.7 times increased risk of becoming a new chronic opioid user. And this is in dentistry and oral surgery where we've had data for years showing that opioids are not only um, probably not any better, but actually maybe even worse. If you account for side effects, nausea, vomiting, constipation, opioids are actually worse for post-dental pain. And yet in 2015, 80% of these teens and healthy young adults received an opioid as a part of that care. Acetaminophen and ibuprofen would be superior, and we're doing this out of convenience, and now we know that there's morbidity. But the great part about being in this space, and in surgery, I'll catch you at the end, okay? Uh, the great part about being in this space is that we can certainly improve prescribing. And, and so I'll take just one through, through one example and probably one of our favorite examples because it was one of our first. This is gallbladder surgery at the University of Michigan. We just wanted to find out what was happening in our own house. If we're going to go around and talk about around the state, we wanted to understand how we're prescribing at the University of Michigan. This is what we found is that after gallbladder surgery, we prescribed the average about 50 pills. Now, you should be a little shocked by that, but I'm going to sadden you to say that this is these data are several years old, probably four or five years old. In the early half of 2017, using another national database, the average for a lap coli in the US is still about 42 pills. Okay, so for everybody who's telling you, oh, it's all changed, it's all different now. In the real world, outside of the ivory towers, first half of 2017, 42 pills for a lap coli still to this point. So 50 is how many we gave. Any guesses on how many people took? Some of you know the story. How many, any guesses? 50, we gave 50. You have to answer. I'm, I'm not moving on. 25, any other guesses? Six. Six was the median. Now, 15 was going to satisfy 75% of people, and we wanted to be very conservative. And so we made it 15 pills is our new number. Just said, hey, God, that, that would be a great reduction. We hadn't really done much work in this space. And the great part about surgery residents is if you tell them 15 pills, it's going to be 15 pills, not 14, not 16. It's 15 pills. And so we found this really amazing change where 15 pills became the new average. And there was spillover effect. They started changing the way they prescribed for lap apis. They started changing the way they prescribed for um, thyroid surgery. I don't know why. It seems like it's a different spot. But they, they changed everything because they had been armed with a little bit of data. And what was cool is we saw no change in refill requests, 4% before, 3% to follow, no change in self-reported pain. And my favorite part, we gave them less and they took less. Now, it's only two pills less. And so maybe in this one case, those two pills don't matter, but let's project this out. What would that look like in spine surgery? What would, look, what would that look like in knee and hip replacement? In fact, we found this consistently in every data set since. Using, uh, using statewide data from 35 health systems, the strongest predictor of how much people used was how much they were given. This is a very uh, old social psychology construct called anchoring and adjustment. I don't normally start my morning with, a, like, a, was that a cinnamon roll? What was that thing? And it was like really delicious and cakey and probably going to sit right here for a while. I don't start my morning that way, but if you put it out for me, I'm likely to eat it, right? And this idea that we can just give people as much as they need or as much as they, just enough so they don't run out and it won't harm them is inherently flawed. This has been shown now in every data set we looked at it. We're just looking at another patient data set of about 1,000 patients. For about every pill you get in excess, after adjustment for other patient factors, you use about an extra half pill. That's a big number. So you get an extra 100, you get 100 pills after accounting for everything. You could be using an extra 40 pills just because of how much you're prescribed without any changes in pain, satisfaction, or refill requests. So a single, a single intervention like this in one health system, 370 lap coli, the last time we checked, 35 pills less per patient. That's like 13,000 pills not in our community. 
So who are we? We're the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. We work with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan's value collaboratives. These value collaboratives are across the state. This is just an example. Uh, all 73 major hospitals in our state, they um, come together on a quarterly basis to talk about quality. And we went to Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and said, let us use this structure to get real world prescribing data real world consumption data actually ask patients what they're taking but not just from academic medical centers from hospitals representative of every hospital in the state of michigan and then make recs and so this our concept is that when we make a prescribing rec we will see reduce reductions in prescribing if we reduce prescribing patients will redu reduce their consumption and you see tons of medical literature out there right now especially in the surgical world about we prescribed this many, they took this many, so this is the new number. But the problem with that concept is you really do have to come back and update again. Because I showed you that anchoring and adjustment concept, that anchoring and adjustment heuristic, the idea that, that when we give them less, now they should take less, it's gonna take a while for us to figure out what the right number is. And we have to be monitoring patient satisfaction and patient reported outcomes. And so there's no need to take a picture of this because it's on our website, but these are our new recs. We have increased the number of recommendations. We started working with other types of surgery, knee and hip replacements, our newest, uh, cardiac surgery. We're seeing huge reductions. But bottom line, while these, we've had some feedback, these are still too high for some cases, the reality is these represent anywhere from a two-fold to a five-fold reduction of what's happening in the real world. And so what are our outcomes? Well, this, these are data from 35 hospitals in the state of Michigan about 7,800 patients. These data were just accepted as a letter in New England Journal. We see, we see that our dog and pony show, what I'm doing right now, is associated with about a half pill per month reduction. This is before we had recommendations. Just going out and talking to surgeons about opioids and the importance of opioid stewardship dropped prescribing by about a half pill per month. And that is significantly faster than the country. Over that same time period, it was about a half pill per six month. So that's great, but then we put out our prescribing recs, and this is what we showed to follow. Just now, given real data, real prescribing recs, we see that over the kind of immediately before this, what you can't see on this graph, to at the end, we had about a 50% reduction in prescribing. And when we measure pain and satisfaction, you see no changes in satisfaction at the top and no changes in self-reported pain. In other words, we're doing this. We're 50% reduction across about 8,000 patients with no ill effects. So we're excited about these data. There's no doubt, as Dan talked about, that this excess prescribing matters. We talked about the story of finding excess pills, but let me put this in context, and some of you have seen this, but if we know that about 45 pills becomes a really consistent average, and we do 1.8 million surgeries in the state of Michigan, that means surgical prescribing alone could be leading to about 62 million pills per year in excess just in our state. And just to put a visual on it, if we think about the area of a hydrocodone tablet, this is what one year's excess prescribing would look like. We'd, need, we'd still need about three quarters of the hockey arena. These pills are everywhere. There are billions and billions of pills. And we know that kids find them. Um, in fact, when, asked, when kids 12 and older who admitted to misusing or abusing an opioid in the year prior were asked, where did you get your medications? More than half of them get them from their uh, friends or family members. That's the big blue. And then there's about 17% that have them left over from their um, own care. We now hear stories of kids pre-selling their excess um, pills from their upcoming dental procedures. This is now happening, multiple narratives floating around about this. And so we have to get these pills out. We're, we're interested in decreasing the flow, but we've now um, hosted, and I'll just give you the truncated version, we've now hosted multiple drives, and this doesn't actually account for the drive we just had. We're up to about 9,500 pounds of pills collected we have a standard operating procedure that we've created for how to do an opioid recovery drive. We just started it here in Ann Arbor as one of our community service efforts. Now we're up to about 50 cities throughout the state and including the Upper Peninsula. And we've actually shared this and Johns Hopkins has now done a couple drives. We're probably up to closer to 160, 170,000 opioids, but countless benzodiazepines and other things. But really what we've done, I'll be blunt, because this is a ton of work. Pounds of pills, I showed you though the excess, so we've really kind of just scratched the surface. What we hope we've done is made people aware of the ill effects of leaving unused pills in their medicine cabinets. We really want to put the opioid drives out of business. We want to do new work that gets rid of the opioid drives, and these are also new data. Um, we, we randomize people to either get usual care after surgery, outpatient surgery, or an information worksheet where they got information on where to find a safe disposal site in their community. 
So very detailed worksheet showing them how to find it. We've made a map of the state of Michigan where you can either use your zip code or just Google in, and we've got every DEA registered facility in our state in there. So we gave them that, or the doTERRA bag. And the doTERRA bag is activated charcoal bag, pour in your pills, add some warm water, and you throw it in the garbage. And we really believe this is where you need to be, right? And what this shows is that people who got the doTERRA bag were much more likely to dispose of their pills. And so we really want to go back to doing other things to serve our community and get away from having to make this two drives a year. This has to be an everyday activity. Um, we've made information pamphlets. I only show these to you in case you're interested because we do allow health systems to brand these. We, uh, this is just an example of our surgical one. You can send us a high resolution logo and we'll put the, your logo on the front and send it back for free and clear use, use with no, there's no ties. We have about 220 health systems in about 20 states who are using these. And there's a couple of uh, national societies that have used these. This is the surgical one. Uh, talks about what is an opioid, using them safely. Talks about addiction and on the back, safe storage and disposal. We have them for dentistry as well, dentistry and oral surgery. And they're in, we have them in Spanish and Arabic. We hope to have one soon for emergency medicine prescribing and for primary care acute prescribing. We're moving into harder stuff now. We're starting to do work when, in transitions of care, screening for opioid use disorder, starting to get naloxone out in our ERs and our surgery and working with our emergency department. And then going back to some nerdier stuff, the stuff that I get kind of back to my traditional roots as a classic nerd. We've got about 60,000 patients enrolled in a biorepository about 80% of whom are opioid naive. And what we're doing is trying to link their health record to their prescription data. Actually, we're, I say SureScripts here, it's actually the MAPS data set, our prescription drug monitoring program. This is the first time the state's ever shared that data for research with their genetic data asked this question, is there a genetic association between that exposure and new persistent use? And I'm really excited because it's actually this week, the geneticists are gonna get the first data set of 27,000 people. Um, and as I wrap up here, I'll just tell you about some other work we're, we're actually doing. We've, we, we have completely, we've completed a musical. I did not write it. That's why it will be good. Um, but we brought in some student, we brought in some people with their own history of both addiction and recovery and then some parents who lost kids. They told their stories to these kids from the School of Music who then went out and wrote songs. We performed a, a couple of those songs at the Harvard event last week and it was really powerful because one of the guys who inspired the song, who has gone through the st full story of heroin addiction and homelessness back to recovery and is now a champion of recovery. One of the songs is about him and I sat next to him as he heard the song for the first time, which was, let me tell you, a really uh, emotional moment. But this, um, this musical is envisioned to go to high schools and middle schools to teach kids about the risks of opioids in a creative way that will hopefully engage them. And we expect to have everything completed. The orchestration is half done and start to hopefully be touring in um, the spring semester. So if you are prescribing right now, or you would kind of think about what are our goals, I've talked a lot about reduction of prescribing. Our goals really over the next year are to think about areas where we don't need to prescribe at all, completely eliminating from those cases that don't need it, but doing so in a patient-centered way that manages pain and enables recovery. We like to educate our surgeons that, you know, there are still things you can be doing today. Tell people pain hurts, you know, surgery hurts, pain is a short period of time and you will get better and that opioids aren't there to make you pain free. We, we, we really need to educate patients about expectations. We need to encourage acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Benzos are a whole separate lecture by themselves and a huge, huge problem we're doing work there. And I am a big proponent of PDMPs. If you don't like PDMPs, come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to teach you a little bit more because really the reality is, is that when I get into that flight on Delta, I want my pilot to know what, who else is out on the runway. And, and, and not looking at a PDP, PDMP is like just cruising down the runway without ever looking. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that Afton and Jen are doing to try to think about other ways. And I don't know if you're gonna be talking about this later, but um, they're, they're really doing some incredible work to think about managing anxiety outside of medications, thinking about really addressing anxiety in a way that we haven't classically done. And so my care path is hopefully a future. Um, and with that, I'll just say, how do we stop this from happening? Well, I think we can do this through getting data, rewarding change, and collaboration. These are my colleagues. Um, Mike Inglesby is a transplant surgeon and runs medical education. And for those that listened to On Point, just this last week, he was on, on Point talking about medical education's role in, um, in teaching patient, in teaching these uh, medical students about opioids and pain. It was a really great interview. And Jen Walji is definitely the smartest and most effective member of our group. She is hard, hard working and just super effective. And this, this picture is probably even dated. We've grown pretty quickly over the last three years. Really exciting group and a lot of collaboration with others in this room that I'm appreciative. 
You can go to our website to find more information about our prescribing recs, our patient materials, and our future work. Thank you.